Amazing. Welcome everyone to Afternoon Tea. I'm Dr. Linda, emergency medicine physician, and I'm here with my lovely co-host, Dr. Erica, GP from the West Midland. And we are both lifestyle medicine physicians. And if you are just tuning in for the first time, let us know where you are tuning in from and what is your favorite hot cup of tea. So I want to start today's afternoon tea with an excerpt from our guest, Dr. Sarai Stancic's book, What's Missing from Medicine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, right, so mm -hmm. let's have a Would you be better with that study? Yeah. Yeah, all good. Okay. So, um, too many of us have been suffering for too long from diseases, conditions, and ailments that we have been told are progressive, incurable, and unavoidably genetic. We have resigned ourselves to a diminished life and closed ourselves off to what we believe is possible for us to experience or achieve. We have come to define ourselves by our symptoms rather than by our potential. In the UK, chronic diseases cause an estimated 89% of deaths. And the main chronic conditions are heart disease, stroke, diabetes, lung disease, and cancers. The good news is that they're preventable to a significant extent by modifying our lifestyle and nutrition. Isn't that just so empowering to know that your health is not determined solely by your genetics and that you have the power to take control? And in our weekly afternoon tea sessions, you can directly converse with experts to find out how you can manage your health with lifestyle and nutrition, even if you have already developed some of these chronic conditions. And you'll see that there are many inspiring stories of people successfully reversing their chronic conditions too. And if you haven't met us before, you can connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, link, LinkedIn, and watch the replays of our previous sessions on YouTube. And we're here for afternoon tea every Sunday at 5 p.m. April is autoimmune conditions um, month in afternoon tea with dogs. And today we are so delighted to have uh, the incredible opportunity to, say, uh, to speak to Dr. Uh, Soraya Stancic uh, to talk about her story of overcoming multiple sclerosis. Soraya Stancic is um, a triple board certified a uh, doctor in internal medicine, infectious diseases, and lifestyle medicine. She graduated from New Jersey Medical School in 1993, and after completing her fellowship, accepted the position as Chief of Infectious Diseases at the Hudson Valley, New York. In later years, she served as translational medical leader at Roche Pharmaceuticals, where she led clinical trials in the field of viral hepatitis and HIV. In 2012, she left her work um, in infectious diseases to fully dedicate her time to the field of lifestyle medicine. Do Dr. Stantik's interest in lifestyle medicine is rooted in her personal story as a patient living with multiple sclerosis. She is the founder of one of the first lifestyle medicine practices in the country, and mentors the Lifestyle Medicine Interest Group at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School. She seeks to spread the power of preventive medicine on global scale and bring needed change to how we train physicians. She is the producer and co-creator of the documentary film Code Blue, which made its global release in May of 2020. Dr. Stantik released her first book earlier this year titled What's Missing from Medicine? Six Lifestyle Changes to Overcome Chronic Illness. She's currently Chief Medical Officer for a new startup seeking to shift the healthcare paradigm. Thank you very much for joining us um, and welcome Dr. Stantik. Thank you so much, Linda and Erica. It's a great pleasure to meet you both. Uh, and it's wonderful to have tea with you today. <laughs> and what is your favorite tea, Dr. Stancic? Earl Grey. Me too. Oh, okay. Lady, Lady Earl Grey or the other one? Oh, I, wait a minute. I don't, I don't know the specifics, so you're going to have to teach me. <laughs> <laughs> I would say to do try the Lady Earl Grey. It's lovely. I'm, I'm learning from you already. <laughs> So Dr. Stancic, we have both been so inspired by your personal journey with MS. 
Um, and we have watched your uh, incredible film, Blue, uh, Code Blue, uh, read your book a couple of times, both of us, uh, and also watched multiple in interviews that you have done on various platforms. Um, and I think that every healthcare professional, professional should watch and read your work because they're just, they speak so much truth and it's something that we we should all know as healthcare professionals. Um, and since we already know your story, but our audience may not do, may not know your story, I wondered if you could take us back from the day in 1995 when you were just 28 years old and on your busy shift in the hospital, what happened? Yeah, so it was October 11th. Yeah. 1995 and um, it my life took a divergent and abrupt uh, change in path when uh, I was uh, diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and it came uh, on this one day I was on call in the hospital very very busy day and running from one end of the hospital to the other literally and in the mid evening hours, I finally found time to take a nap. And when I was paged again to try to get up out of that, I couldn't feel my legs. And it came that that abruptly. Uh, the MRI in the emergency room uh, showed multiple lesions in my brain and spinal cord and, and the diagnosis was made. And, and everything changed because, it, Erica, if you had asked me earlier that day on October 11th, how are things going? I would have said to you, I'm a, I'm a healthy young physician. What I wouldn't have told you was the fact that I was also sleep deprived, highly stressed, eating primarily out of vending machines and takeout food. I was a very unhealthy young woman and didn't realize it. And certainly the lifestyle that I was leading was fueling the development of this disease. So I, I certainly had a genetic predisposition to autoimmunity and it was expressed um, with by, and fueled by this, this terrible uh, lifestyle that I was leading. Uh, and then I suddenly went from being a young healthy physician to a chronic illness patient hospitalized. Um, and over the following eight years, uh, my quality of life continued to, to worsen. Uh, I was having exacerbations every three to six months. And each time I had an event, I would lose a little bit of neurological function. I found myself by 2003, dependent on a dozen medications. And despite all of those medicines, the disease uh, continued to progress. And then in 2003, I, I call it my aha moment or the blueberry moment, right? When by chance I came across a silly little publication that talked about um, how diet might in fact affect multiple sclerosis. And I was struck by this because here I was an attending physician uh, and I knew nothing about nutrition. But it certainly caught my attention and um, led to wanting to learn as much as I could about this connection between diet and, and chronic disease. Uh, and it is then that I came across literature uh, published in 1952 in the New England Journal of Medicine by a physician called Roy Swank, who published data uh, looking at MS in Norway, which had one of the highest rates of MS in the world. And he, he hypothesized then that somehow saturated fat consumption was playing a role in the pathogenesis of multiple sclerosis. And interestingly, he didn't just leave it at hypothesis. He actually started managing MS patients. Remember in the 1950s, there were no treatments available for MS. So he started to treat them with this low fat plant-based diet. And he followed a cohort of 140 plus patients over more than 30 years and, and published data in the Lancet Journal. And in the Lancet Journal in 1990, he concluded that 95% of his patients remained disability free. When I read this, um, I was struck by it and it offered me a great deal of hope. Uh, so I went to my doctors to talk about this idea of diet and, and lifestyle, because, you know, it wasn't just swank. As I delved into the literature, uh, certainly diet was important, by, but there were so, other, so many other lifestyle factors that, of course, were relevant here. So I began to um, understand in my own mind that 
possibly by modifying my behaviors and modifying my choices that I could potentially uh, improve uh, outcomes and potentially slow the progression of the disease. And so when I proposed this to my physicians, they thought it was outlandish and irresponsible. Uh, but at some point, I came to the realization that the course on which I was on, the, these 12 medications with depression, inability to sleep, uh, injection site reactions, the flu-like illness that I experienced from the medications, I just couldn't maintain this. It was too difficult. So I made the unconventional decision in 2003 to uh, responsibly taper off of all of those medications. And instead I would optimize every aspect of my lifestyle. So it was my diet, my exercise, my stress, my sleep. And it didn't happen in a week or in a month, but over time I started to feel better. And I went from this young woman dependent on a cane, dozen medications, occasionally on a diaper, to seven years later crossing the finish line at a marathon. And it was um, truly an extraordinary moment for me because it wasn't just that I had run this marathon, but that the work that I had done to improve my lifestyle had certainly borne fruit. And today, 25 years since my diagnosis, I'm medication free, disability free. And it is why I am so empowered to share this message with whomever is willing to hear it because there's nothing special about me. We can all do this. We can all implement these simple changes into our lives. But I think the average individual doesn't understand the power of lifestyle because regrettably physicians and healthcare professionals are not speaking to this. And it's not because we're bad or we're poorly informed or we're bad doctors it's because our educational system is failing to convey these messages during the time of our education. The curriculum does not reflect uh, the importance of, of what, what, I, what we call, right, salutogenesis. In medical school, we learn pathogenesis, which is the study of illness and the disease state. What we don't learn is the opposite of that, which is salutogenesis. How do we maintain health and well-being? And so I believe that if we were to modify our curricula and assure that all doctors get this messaging, that we could, in a meaningful way, change uh, the quality of life of so many across the globe. And so largely my mission is to relay that message, uh, not only utilizing my example as a patient and having gone through what I did, but in the many years of practicing medicine over 27 years, I've seen so much pain and suffering and loss that I know is largely preventable now. And so uh, that is, I think my responsibility as a physician to support patients in modifying their behavior so they too can, can uh, live free of chronic disease and age gracefully. What an incredible story, Dr. Stancic. And can I take you back to when you first uh, were diagnosed um, I believe they put you through the MRI scanner originally on that fateful day. Um, and unfortunately, the story wasn't broken, the diagnosis wasn't broken to you in the most uh, gentle fashion. How, how did you find out that you had a mess? Yeah. Well, yeah, I was in the MRI machine for about two hours. And, and while I was in there, I started to experience very, uh, like, you know, shooting pain down my left leg. So it was, and I had no idea what was happening. It was a terrifying experience. Once I was wheeled out on, on the gurney, I was waiting to be transferred to my room. I heard the radiologist who was on call that um, morning and he screamed out, go get the residents, the medical students. This is a gr an amazing case of multiple sclerosis. These images are really uh, uh, impressive. And he, he didn't. He wasn't aware that I was there, that I could hear him. But it was it was as if someone had kicked me right in the gut. Because um, it's it's funny if you were to objectively listen to the case as a physician, right? Young female, a, acute neurological loss. You're thinking MS. I mean, that's the logical diagnosis. But when you're in it, 
uh, you're not, I had no idea what was happening. I kept thinking, oh, I wore heels the other night. Maybe it was, you know, you, you know, you come up with every possible meaning, um, potential explanation for, for what was happening. And then uh, it just felt like my life was over. That it, it couldn't have been worse. And, and that um, I knew what MS was. I, I had spent time on, a, on an urology ward as a fourth year medical student and had seen many end stage MS patients. So that was the image that immediately populated in, in my mind. So I was terrified. Um, mm -hmm. And that was the beginning. Again, it felt like the worst day of my life. Oh, I'm getting shivers down my spine just hearing that to have that broken to you in such a terrible way. Um, but if our listeners don't know yet, what, what is MS, Dr. Stansik? So multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease. So autoimmune meaning that your immune system is attacking you. So the immune system is supposed to protect us. It's supposed to protect us from foreign invaders. So bacteria, virus, a precancerous cell. The immune system is supposed to come in and take care of that, destroy it so it doesn't progress. In an autoimmune disease, our immune system is confused and it starts to think parts of us are foreign and starts to attack it. So there are many different types of autoimmune diseases uh, and each one has a different target, right? So in multiple sclerosis, it attacks myelin, which is the fatty sheath that protects our brain and spinal cord. So it pops holes in that, um, in that sheath. And so electrical impulses are not able to progress a normal. So there, there are neurological symptoms that, that um, the patient will report like numbness, tingling, weakness. Um, sometimes, patients can develop something called optic neuritis where there's transient blindness. I had that uh, at one point in my life. So, and it typically is a disease that we see in, in most likely in women and, and young women, usually in the second or third decade of life is the primary um, period where we see this diagnosis. So again, if if you were to hear objectively the story, a 28 year old female presents with uh, numbness or weakness, your, your first thought is multiple sclerosis. Mm. And what is the progression of this disease over time? So there's different uh, categories of multiple sclerosis. There's relapsing remitting, and that's the most common. And typically most patients will stay re relapsing remitting for about 10 to 15 years. And then they progress into what we call secondary progressive. And that's, so relapsing remitting means you have an event and then you get better, right? There, so it waxes and wanes. Once you move into the secondary progressive stage, um, things don't get better. So they progressively worsen. There's also another category called primary progressive. So at initial, at the time that you're initially diagnosed, you have uh, a, a neurological event, but it never gets better despite uh, treatment with, with steroids. Um, and that's the minority, that's about 15% of those that are, and, and typically that tends to be more in men. Uh, but the great majority of individuals uh, when they're first diagnosed are relapsing remitting. Now we do have um, a myriad of what we call disease modifying therapies that are used to slow the progression of multiple sclerosis. It cannot be, MS is a, is a disease that cannot be cured. The treatments that we have available to us are, are treatments that will slow the progression. So at the time when I was first diagnosed in 1995, there was only one drug approved by the FDA. It was a drug called beta -seron. Uh, today, there are more than a dozen medications, uh, but they are uh, disease-modifying therapies that uh, do ha cause some type of immunosuppression, as you might imagine. So um, there is, of course, a side effect profile to every potential regimen. So um, for me, the, the beta seron uh, was a, was the drug that I was taking. Uh, it was a drug that I would have to inject every night. and. I would inject the drug at 10 o'clock and at two o'clock in the morning, I would wake up with like violent shaking chills and fever. Um, it caused uh, insomnia, uh, depression, uh, suicidal thoughts are, are, are one of the concerns with this medication. So it was a, it was a very difficult uh, drug to tolerate over many years. And when you were put on these drugs, were you explained 
what are the side effects and and actually why do you have to take them will they get ms better is there an option uh, with these drugs that you can actually uh, have a better quality of life on the long term or well the the goal is to slow the progression of the disease so so the natural progression of the disease is you know continuous uh debilitation and and loss um and the the idea is to prevent dependency on a cane or a walker or a diaper or you know a nursing home setting which is uh regrettably uh potentially endpoint of this when i was diagnosed linda the neurologist came into my room and he said there's a lot of burden of disease in your brain and in your spinal cord so i had lesions both in my brain and spinal cord and he said to me at the age of 28 you will likely be in a wheelchair those were sobering um words for me to hear and so he said to me the 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 only uh hope you have of preventing that from happening is starting this disease modifying therapy i'll never forget he said to me um you're actually lucky with to be diagnosed now because this drug was just approved prior to 1995 there was no treatment that had been approved by any uh you know agency to slow the progression so he said to me if you remain compliant with this medication maybe it won't be 10 to 20 years maybe it'll be 15 or 25 years but ultimately you will end up in a wheelchair so the, so the the idea was that the drug could got could buy me a few years of of walking and and some you know in, in independence because essentially he said to me at some point you're you're going to i mean we talked about uh, long-term um, placement and and I was only 28 so when you you're 28 20 years uh, feels like a long time but that's at 48 that you're still young at 48 um, so of course when he said that to me I I, I was uh, absolutely I was going to take the medication he said to me I mean he's this physician was an MS expert one of the the best in the country. And um, he said to me that this was my only uh, uh, approach. And so, of course, I was going to, going to follow those recommendations. It just wasn't, it wasn't working for me in that the, the treatment, I mean, I was still having exacerbations regularly. Maybe if I wasn't taking the treatments, I would have them more. I don't know. But I was, I was taking the medicine. Uh, and the medicine itself was making me feel terrible. I had no energy. You know, one of the most common symptoms that MS patients report is uh, fatigue. And, and the fatigue from the disease alone was incapacitating. Like it feels like you don't even wanna get out of bed, like this heaviness that you carry with you all the time. And then on top of that, I had to take this medicine that was and and I was still a medical resident. I still needed to finish uh, my residency and then go on to do a fellowship as an infectious disease specialist. Uh, and I was still 28 years old, and I still wanted. I still had to live my life. I wasn't just an MS patient, right? I, so I struggled, uh, but I I did at one point in my life. I was dependent on a cane. Uh, it got to that point, uh, and I and I tried. There was, and I hated using the cane because you can envision how I'm. Uh, I'm a physician, so I I would go to work with the cane, and then patients would come in to see me for their infectious disease reason, and they would say to me, "Doctor Stancic, why are you walking with a cane? Because you don't expect young doctors to be walking with canes." And I never wanted it to you know, they have 20 minutes with me or during their visit to to address their issues. And they're all asking me about my like, why are you walking with a cane? So it was really uncomfortable for me to talk about that with patients um, because it was so my diagnosis was so uh, visible to them. Uh, and so I struggled with sharing the diagnosis because then it turns into 
oh my gosh, Dr. Stanzik, we feel, you know, and I, I really hated to have that pity thing or people worrying about me or all of a sudden when, once you have a diagnosis like that and you're young, you're defined by the diagnosis. So I'm the doctor with MS. And the first question people would ask me is, how are you feeling? And I hated that. Um, so I wanted to do everything I could uh, to hide the diagnosis, but that took great effort to do that. So I, en I ended up doing silly things like not using a cane when I really needed to, or trying to do trying to cover it up took so much out of me that it only worsened things for me. So I think in retrospect, um, I think of, I should have been more transparent about the diagnosis, but but it just took away from the work that I needed to do in caring for my patients. Um, but it it was it was a difficult time, and often I look back and I say to myself, "Wow, how did you do it?" How did you manage to get through uh, your training, uh, work full time, get married, have a child? Um, somehow, uh, God gave me the strength to accomplish those things. But uh, when I look back, I say to myself, that was a tough time. It was a tough time. You're a superwoman, Dr. Stanzig. Honestly, getting yeah. married, having well, I think, I think we all yes. But yeah. some of us are more than other. Let's just let just acknowledge how incredible you have done because I've gone through residency in our own UK terms and without any uh, any of those disabilities in the beginning, and all of us have have struggled. And it's it's a really time consuming, energy consuming um, work, and you have done it. And you have through this whole time you were on medications from the beginning of your training. How long uh, were you on? On medications, how many years? I was on and off medication, and there was and there were other medications beyond beta serum. Then Copaxone was approved, and um, there were there were others. Avinex was another one that I was on. Uh, all in all, it was about eight years. So from 1995 to 2003, and 2003 was when I when I read that first publication, and that led me to Swank and other studies. Uh, and that's when I started to piece it together. Uh, and in 2003, I remember I, I, I told my doctor, I can't do this anymore. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to take this leap of faith and, and I'm going to really um, optimize every aspect of my lifestyle. So it wasn't just the food, um, it was exercise. Back, this is, whenever I think of this, I, it just, it, se it seems crazy, but back in the, in the 1990s, it was felt that exercise worsened MS. So physicians advised you not, not to exercise, right? Uh, and, and so I didn't exercise for eight years. I did very little to nothing. And actually I didn't, I didn't even have much energy to exercise to be frank. Uh, so when I first started, my husband bought me that stationary bike and it's actually still here in my home. It, uh, it belongs in a museum somewhere. <laughs> I, my, he would help me to get on that bike and uh, I struggled to even get onto it and I could do a minute, two, and then it, the pain, the numbness, the tingling would, 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 um, would, would follow and then he would help me to get off. I mean, I, I'm, by the way, I'm, I am married to a, 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 such a wonderful man who's been with me throughout all of this and has been so supportive and I would have never been able to have done all of this without him. Uh, and, but, you know, the next day back on that, every day I did it, even though it was so frustrating because I could do very little, but over time that minute turned into three minutes and then 10 minutes and, and it continued to expand. And that feeling of that numb, Uthoff's phenomenon, if you're familiar with that, is when in MS patients, when your blood, when your body temperature goes up, your neurological sy symptoms worse. And that's because of the, the transmission in the nerve the impulse is compromised when body temperature goes up. So for people who have MS, that's called Uthoff's phenomena. And I, but what I realized was that if I continued, I would ultimately overcome that. And so now I'm able to get on my bike and I'm able to run or, and I, and I don't experience those symptoms anymore. But in the early on, I didn't know. 
in, uh, and I, and now I'm in the field of MS, it's agreed that exercise is an important part of managing MS patients. So we've learned, but think of, for eight years, I was so deconditioned, I, I could do very little. And, and so imagine I went from that to being able 20, in 2010 to cross the finish line at, at the marathon, which was, you know, a big. Unbelievable. <laughs> And can you tell us about that moment uh, when you first got on the bike? I love that story, how you, had to, you really had to fight through those few, first few minutes um, because it was so difficult for you just to pedal for a few minutes. Oh, it was just, it was incredibly difficult. Just getting onto the bike, I couldn't do that on my own. And <clears throat> my husband actually would have to help me put my foot into the, onto the pedals, onto the straps. Uh, and... I would, I would look at the clock for the minute and I would just, oh my God, I, I just wanted to finish the one minute. Uh, and, and it felt like, the, it felt like that second was just going, like it had frozen, like it wasn't moving. I would tell my husband, we, I just want to do one minute. I could, and you know, you start to sweat because it, because it's now it's hurting. It's, you go through these stages where you go from numbness uh, to tingling to pain and by the time I got to that first minute, it was pain. And then how, and, and um, this like uh, sensitivity, helping him come, help, my husband helping me come off and then sitting there for about 15 to 20 minutes to recover from it, drinking water and trying to just, and then, and then the, trying to pull together the courage to get back on the next day. But I knew that every day I had to do a little bit. And, and as I said, and that's the other thing about folks want uh, another lesson that I think is really important, particularly here in the United States, we like things to happen overnight. We want the quick fix. We want the, you know, the solution that comes lifestyle medicine and what we're talking about today. That's not, that's not the way it works. It's about patience, persistence and, and perseverance. So uh, I knew that I, again, when I say, um, I ran a marathon and I'm an MS patient. People think that happened overnight. It didn't. Uh, there were lots of difficult moments between point A and point B, uh, but I knew that I was traveling in the right direction. And so I gave it a little bit every day. And I think that's so, you know, when, when we develop chronic conditions, it doesn't take, you know, one unhealthy meal or one cigarette to do that. It takes years of, um, you know, uh, poor lifestyle choices um, and um, an inflammation that has been ongoing for years and years for us to develop these conditions. So equally, when we go the other way, um, to get better, it takes time too. So um, yeah, that things don't happen overnight. But I was wondering what gave you the courage to keep getting back onto the bike when it hurts so much? That's a really good question. Um, I, I don't know. It was, it was just something innate um, that I just felt like it was the right thing. I had read all of the, so much evidence. I really, I probably spent three to four months of just like digesting literature uh, and, and, and understanding the benefits of exercise, the anti-inflammatory benefits of exercise and understanding cytokines that are released and, you know, the science behind exercise. And I said, well, it's got to make sense. I mean, this is an inflammatory disease. My immune system is attacking me. I need to do anything that is going to fall into the anti-inflammatory category. And exercise seemed right. And I, and I started to realize also that the time that it took to recover from, from that, that Oudhoff's phenomenon, start, that length of time was shortening. And I, and I started to Simultaneously, um, the fatigue that I had been burdened with for so many years was starting to lift. That exercise that I was introducing was somehow offering me another benefit um, and a little more energy. I felt like I could stay up a little bit longer. Um, I felt early on, probably within the first six months, I started to build confidence that I could leave the cane in my car on occasion um, so I started to see, and, and I have to say, and, and to be fully transparent, that first year, was, there was a lot of um, 
just intuition because there were a lot of things that went wrong. I had an exacerbation that first year. At the end of that first year, I had a pretty bad exacerbation. And that's when everybody said to me, look what you've done. You discontinued the medication and this is the consequence of that. You're hurting yourself. But I, even then, and I took this, I took methylprednisol, the solumedrol um, as prescribed to overcome that, that exacerbation. But despite that, I felt I was going in the right direction. There was something about this that I needed to pursue. Uh, and so I continued, but always very um, cautious. Even today, uh, I never say I'm cured of MS. I have a lot of respect for this disease. And every day I wake up knowing that I have to do the right thing to manage it. There are times where uh, I get stressed just like everyone else, or I tr I'm traveling and I don't sleep enough. And, I, and when I do those things, when I fall off the wagon a little bit, I, I feel it. And so I, it, it's a reminder to me to make sure that, I'm, that I'm, I stay on point. And I'm really very methodical about my lifestyle, about what every day, I wake up at five o'clock in the morning and every night I fall asleep at nine o'clock. I'm, I'm, those are, that is really important. I mean, of course there are, it's uh, new year's Eve. I'll stay up late, later. There are moments in time where you're not going to be exact, but on most days, that's my schedule to the point that I don't have an alarm clock. I wake up because my body knows to get up and, and at five o'clock, boy, do I have energy. I'm like, you know, I, I feel amazing and I'm ready to go out for a run or a hike or something. There's always physical activity first thing in the morning. Um, there's always gratitude first thing in the morning. These are, you know, I come back from that and I, and I have my breakfast. I don't skip my meals. I always find time. I put myself first. And, that, and that's saying a lot because many of us, particularly women, we, we don't put ourselves first, right? We put everyone else first. And that was an important lesson that I needed to learn um, because if I don't put myself first and I don't take care of myself, I won't be there for my husband. I won't be there for my children. And that's saying, I have a son who's disabled, who, who needs, who has a lot of needs and he's my world in many ways. But I know that I need to do those things. In the morning, mom wakes up, she goes for her walk or run or whatever it is that I'm gonna do. I'll have my, my cup of coffee or tea uh, and have my breakfast and, and start off my day. I don't, I don't work excessive hours. I'm not one of these people who's checking work email on the weekend. I'm not. When I'm working, I give it 110%. But when I'm not working, I give whatever. And this is about mindfulness, right? And living in the moment. And right now, it's all about Dr. Erica and Dr. Linda uh, in this moment. And I'm here to enjoy this conversation with you. But I think that's another important lesson that um, so many of us are, are our minds are running, uh, uh, you know, a mile a minute, and we have so much going on, and we don't tend to appreciate or live in, in the present moment. And I think that's important. Mm. I love what you said earlier about just literally going back to basics, going back and looking at the science, which. A lot of us have forgotten because we learn about those things at the start of medical school and along the way we've kind of forgotten about the basic science the basic physiology about how the body works and the anti-inflammatory effect of uh, physical activity and same goes with our um, nutrition as well and i know you have come to um, embrace a whole food plant-based diet and that is through your research in the evidence as well, wasn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Tell us more about that. Right. So the so the evidence overwhelmingly uh, in the scientific literature speaks to a diet that is rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds. Now, with that said, I don't like to use the term vegan uh, because I don't think you have to be one hundred percent vegan. And, and by the way, and you, and you all know this, vegan, you can be vegan and be very unhealthy, right? You can eat, chip, drink beer and be, be vegan. And, and that's not going to, to offer you an optimal um, lifestyle. So to me, it's about in, include, because I think when we use terms where you can't eat this, you can't do that, um, we lose people along the way. I want to be as inclusive as possible. And I'm criticized sometimes for that. 
but I think it's important that we meet patients where they are and help them to understand that the key is to bring in more fiber rich foods into your diet and fiber only comes in plants. It doesn't come in animals, right? And for MS, there's again, you know, Swank who talked about, he talked about saturated fat. He sort of had it, uh, he had it right, but for the wrong reasons. Um, we, we're learning in, in multiple sclerosis so much about these connections between dietary choice and outcomes. Swank um, made that connection when we, inc when we increase our plant um, sources on our plate, that patients have improved symptoms, that they have better outcomes, that they remain disability free longer. But how was that? And, and so for so many years, neurologists and MS specialists have questioned, like how in the world does what you put on your plate affect an autoimmune disease, a neurological autoimmune disease that attacks your brain and spinal cord? Like how, what is the connection? And there's been several publications in the past several years that have illustrated a connection. And the connection is that when you eat a plant-based diet, rich in fiber, you're modifying the makeup of the microbiome, right? Which is these bacteria and virus that live in our gut. And we know through the human, um, pro the human genome project, uh, we've learned a lot about these bugs. And these bugs are very, very important in regards to our outcomes, our health outcomes. Uh, they're signaling um, in many ways, the immune system. So when we have um, a fiber rich diet, we're, we're increasing the population of these good bugs that then produce these chemicals or these signals that then communicate with the immune system. And there was an interesting study that was published, I think it was in 2017, a, a small pilot study in Italy that looked at that. And they found that you know, in patients, in MS patients that were eating a fiber rich diet, they had an organism called lactnosphericae that was enriched in their microbiome. And that bug produces a chemical called butyrate. And butyrate has a favorable um, effect on, on the immune system. So in those patients, they, they showed that there was a decrease in progression of disease and improvement in symptoms. So I, I think it's, you know, we're learning a lot about it, but we're starting to see these connections. And, and you, you said in your book, you know, this is not an MS diet. This is not a diabetes diet. So th speak about that a little bit, because we, we still get asked, you know, quite often, um, people might think that what we talk about in lifestyle medicine is specific to a condition. Um, so tell us more about that. Not right. So I always see the um, books entitled you know, the Alzheimer's diet or the heart disease diet or the diabetes diet. And I go and I scratch my head. There is no diet. There's a healthy diet and, and the, the healthy diet, the one that is going to allow us, here's my, here's, I say this all the time. I say it in the book. But I sound like a broken record, but it's so important. It needs to be said. The idea here is for each and every one of us to age gracefully free of chronic disease, right? And then on that last day on planet earth, be it at age 85, 95, or 105, that on that last day on planet earth, we experience a beautiful, joyful day with our family and friends, lovingly enjoy a meal together, share important moments. And then on that day, you go home, you go to bed, and you peacefully pass away. That's my hope for each and every one of us, that there isn't that bookend of suffering at the end of life. And the way we can do that is very simple. We need to stop complicating things and making uh, the public believe that it, it requires some formula or we need to eat more plants. We need to uh, consume whole foods, real foods, not processed junk uh, that, that has taken over our world. I mean, think about some of the foods that we, are, are existent today, if you go to the local supermarket, our great, great grandmothers wouldn't recognize it as food. It, it looks, it, 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 they wouldn't be sure what to do with it. We need to go back to our roots and eat the way our ancestors did, which is primarily plants. Uh, and if we did that, and, and again, what percentage, if you're going to have animal sources in your diet, what percentage is reasonable? 
I don't know, but it's it's definitely the minority. I personally do not consume any animal sources in my diet. Uh, I don't need them. I don't find them interesting. I have a, a very diverse uh, and, and satisfying and gastronomically exciting diet, all different types of foods and spices and cultures and ethnicities. I love it all. I want as much diversity on my plate as possible because I know that each and every one of these um, options brings something new to me and, and, and that will serve. But this whole idea that we need to consume dairy in order to get enough calcium, I mean, that's been debunked. Even the New England Journal of Medicine published a, a review article in, in the spring of 2020 speaking about the, de the detrimental effects of milk in our diet, which was big. Um, so we, the bottom line is that what we need to do is encourage the consumption of more fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds. And if we just convey that loving message and not talk to patients or communities like this, if you eat that, you're bad. We don't wanna do that. We don't wanna point fingers at anyone. We wanna invite as many into the fold. And then there's all these different diets. I know there's competing diets and everyone thinks they have the solution to the problem. But anyone who's, who's sharing or suggesting that their diet uh, is the, listen, the, the solution is, as I said, uh, unequivocally, the literature speaks to this, that we need to consume uh, more vegetation, more plants on our plate. And I think if we do that, we're going to, we're going to take a big step in the right direction. Yeah. And you, so we've kind of, we've talked about how physical activity has benefited you and uh, switching to a whole food plant-based diet, how that's affected you. Um, I know you also suffered quite a bit with sleep as well. Yes. Can you speak to that? Sure. Yeah. So sleep was one of the hardest uh, issues to overcome because Erica, I was addicted to Ambien for many, many years. Every time I went to the doctor, they wrote me a prescription for Ambien. And I loved it because I'll tell you why. I, I would take this medicine uh, and I would be knocked out in half an hour. And it was great. And I'll tell you why, because then I didn't have to suffer. I was no longer in pain. I didn't have to think about living with MS. Because every day was a struggle. Just getting out of bed was a struggle. Walking around with the pillbox was a struggle, the pain. And so this allowed me a respite. But what I learned and what I didn't realize at the time was that I wasn't sleeping effectively. Even though I was out, I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't transitioning through those important stages of sleep. It, it was all a facade. And I, as I read again, the literature and understood sleep physiology, again, something I didn't learn in medical school, right? I realized I needed to come off this drug. And then th that very first night of Ambien free was really hard. And, and there were several nights that I just couldn't sleep. And I so desperately, and there were times where I became so frustrated that I I took an Ambien just to get through the night. And so there was a lot of back and forth, um, but little by little, I started to taper. Uh, and I think that it took me about three to six months to completely come off of that medication. But I learned good sleep hygiene, what the environment should be, cool, dark, and quiet, assuring that I wasn't you know, consuming any caffeinated products or alcohol and, and, and understanding how uh, my stress was contributing to when I got into bed, I was so uh, busy, you know, my mind again, running through that incessant reel of thought and understanding that I needed to, to learn how to slow that down. And that's where stress management techniques came in and the idea of prayer or meditation to help me slow things down and help me to understand this idea of mindfulness and living in the present moment. And so I used all of those tools to um, the pre-sleep rituals, assuring that I was, you know, I, I talk about this in the book, keeping a, a, a diary about what I, a sleep diary about what I was consuming throughout the day and I'm connecting the dots. Oh, wait, I'm having 
coffee at three o'clock in the afternoon during a shift, well, that's going to affect my sleep or, um, you know, e eating too late, understanding all of those little simple things. And as I began to peel back the layers, um, I fixed each one of these. And all of a sudden, I learned how to sleep effectively. One of the most important things was creating structure around the time that I went to bed and I woke up. And when I did all of those things, I went from this woman who was self-defined uh, as an insomniac to what I call myself today, a professional sleeper. I love to sleep. Um, I, I, can, I go to bed and within 10 to 15 minutes, I fall asleep peacefully and I sleep through the night. I do have to wake up to go to the bathroom because I, I, I've been living with MS for 25 years and it's done damage to my bladder, which is, but it's fine. I can do that and go right back to bed and fall asleep. And I wake up in the morning, I sleep my eight hours and I feel refreshed and I, and I feel refurbished and I'm ready to go. But for years, I didn't know how to do that. And I think that that is so empowering. So, and, I, and that for my, for my patients who come to see me, when I take that first uh, history and we talk about their sleep and, and w when we fix that piece of it, it, it change, it's, it's, meaning, it's so meaningful. Re recuperative sleep is so, so important. Yeah. <laughs> I love it how you redefine your way of uh, thinking about where you fit in the insomniac level. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I think we love to put labels on uh, I'm a pizza eater, I'm a meat eater, I'm an insomniac, and we kind of perpetuate our own story. We do. Looking for a solution to the problem that we are at, um, that yeah. we are having. Such an important point. I hear people say that to me all the time. Well, Dr. Dr. Stanzik, I'm, you know, I have a sweet tooth or I crave salty. I, I'm never going to be able to change that. You really don't. Uh, you, you, the reason you have a sweet tooth is because you're eating these processed foods that are, that are designed to keep you addicted. There's a, there's a wonderful book uh, entitled The End of Overeating. Um, by, the author's name is, uh, his first name is David, last name is escaping me. I'll think of it in a moment, but he was a prior lead at the um, FDA here in the United States. And he wrote this book uh, and in it, he describes how these foods by these companies are created to keep us addicted. They layer sugar, salt, and fat, and they know the exact combination that is going to hit those um, dopamine releasing areas of our brain. And we love it. And it, that's why you can't eat one Oreo cookie, <laughs> not because you're weak or because you have a sweet tooth. It's all of us if, if, we're, if, if that's what we can do. So the, what we need to do is interrupt the consumption of it. And then, you know, you're going to regain control. The hard part is, of course, is uh, interrupting um, the habit. And, um, but once you do that, you're going to regain control and then you're able to make good choices. But it, it's not, it's not that you, you in particular have any weakness. It's just that the, regrettably, these very powerful companies are producing these foods that keep us, um, addicted yes and they enslave us into their their perfect equation to spend money on them which is really heartbreaking for physicians to it see um, because it's so above uh, our ability to to be there with the patient in the time when it's happening we would love to be there and just like you can do it you can stop it now you know, we'll, we'll walk you through this and, you know, tomorrow it's going to be easier. And it's the same with exercise and sleep. Just take that one step, one uh, habit that you break. Like That's the, hard, the hardest step is that first step. <laughs> Incredible. And you walk through these steps in your book, What's Missing from Medicine. It's uh, not just for physicians, it's for everyone who wants to I use the principles of lifestyle medicine to incorporate it into your lives. Um, we do study lifestyle medicine from an evidence uh, perspective for doctors, but um, what I loved about your book is that you translated it into such a digestible bits that everybody can understand the principles and uh, how they can start implementing that into their lifestyle. Um, so certainly if anybody wants to get the story and how Dr. Stantit 
uh, uh, was able to add this into her life. Uh, do check it out. What's missing from medicine? It's now out in the UK. Finally, the paper version as well. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, yeah. I, I'm, the book was meant to be just a conversation between myself and the reader, and I just wanted it to be very honest. And I th and I think the beauty of all of this is that it's so simple. There's a lot of things in medicine that are complicated, so many things that are complicated. I mean, I spent the early part of my career working on uh, HIV and hepatitis C um, and developing treatments. Those are difficult and complicated, but this part, this is easy. And, and that's what is the beauty of it. And, and the other piece is that when you implement these optimal lifestyle choices into your life to maybe address your MS or address your diabetes or address your rheumatoid arthritis, that you're also going to simultaneously reduce your risk of breast cancer, of Alzheimer's disease, of diabetes, of heart disease. I mean, it's, it's, it's a wonderful prescription and there's no side effects. It's just, I mean, think about it. I mean, it's very rare that you can write a prescription for something that doesn't potentially have, a, I mean, every drug, you know, this has a side effect profile. Mm -hmm. So many good drugs are available to us. I mean, think about in the world of HIV, which is when I, I became interested in the field of infectious diseases because as a young medical student, it was the in the eight, late eighties, early nineties, when I was in school, it was the height of the HIV epidemic. And in our hospital, regrettably, we had an entire ward of AIDS patients, it was so sad. We could only treat the opportunistic infection. So in one night, we would see a PCP pneumonia, we would see a toxoplasmosis, a CMV retinitis, and we would treat them, but we had nothing to manage the virus itself, right? It was later that we developed the, this armamentarium of antiretrovirals and they have changed, uh, the, the, changed this disease, this diagnosis from once a death sentence to a, a disease that is a chronic disease that we can manage largely, right? So, but each one of these life-saving drugs has a side effect profile, right? Each one of them. Um, but we have to weigh out a risk benefit of every decision we make in medicine. But wouldn't it be wonderful if we could prevent 80% of diseases, which is what the literature tells us, the Potsdam study tells us that we could prevent 80% of chronic disease. 81% of heart attacks we could prevent. That's 600,000 lives here in the United States. And 600,000 plus Americans die every year of heart disease, a disease that we know how to prevent. Diabetes continues to grow. When I was in medical school, 2% of diabetics in this country. Now we're at 10% and the CDC predicts by 2050, 30% of Americans will be living with diabetes. That's crazy. It continues to grow every year and we know how to prevent it. Unequivocally, we know how to prevent it. And, and and what are we doing? We're just developing yet another drug to treat diabetes. That's not the solution to the problem. The solution to the problem is conveying these messages, these very simple messages to each and every one of the members of our community across the globe. And if we do that, think of not only the, 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 the morbidity and mortality that we're gonna prevent, think about all the money we're gonna save and how that can be utilized elsewhere in, in such an important fashion. I mean, I just hope, I'm so grateful to the two of you for doing what you're doing uh, and, and for serving your community to get the word out. And so as more and more physicians speak to this, I think um, we're, going to, we're going to, again, act together to, to change the world. Yeah, as you, as you said, you know, lifestyle medicine prescription has no side effects, really. Um, and um, yet a lot of healthcare professionals are resistant to um, the concept of lifestyle medicine. And I think I remember watching one of your interviews and you said that you went back to your first MS doctor. Uh, mm -hmm. And when you told him about um about you know your lifestyle changes he didn't really want to hear about it and actually said that you had a mild form of maybe you had a mild form of ms was this the same doctor who told you that you had huge disease burden on your brain yes yes right um right 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 uh i think I, 
with on for this in, individual, I think um, he was just so um, stuck in his way that there was just no way, no way that he was going to change. Um, I think I mean, he's a little bit older now. At the time when I was 28, he was probably my age. So you can envision he's probably in his late 70s now. But um, and he's a wonderful man and 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 really cared about me and and my but I, I think from his perspective not staying on the medication to him was deleterious and i understand because that's the world in which he grew up and and that's all he knew and that's that's all i knew uh, before i became aware and again i only became aware because i was desperate and sick um he would say to me and, and it wasn't just him because I've had many MS doctors over the years because at some point they 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 don't tolerate me any longer and they pass me along to other doctors. But um, he he would just say to me, you need to remain compliant on this medicine in order for, to reduce that risk of progression. But what he didn't know and what he couldn't understand and maybe I couldn't convey it to him was that I didn't want to live that way anymore. My life was terrible. I had no quality of life. I mean, when you wake up when you're 32 years old and you don't want to get up because it's too painful, like I don't think he understood that. And that's why sometimes I often, and I say this and and some of my patients uh, find it hard to believe, I, I look back retrospectively now at, at my diagnosis and Although I, I thought at first that it was, why is this happening to me? This is so unfair. This is the worst day of my life. I look at it now and, and think it's the best day of my life because I needed to have that experience to evolve, uh, to arrive at who I am today. Had I not had that experience. And there was a lot of difficult moments throughout uh, those years, but those lessons and those experiences have allowed me to be who I am, made me a better mother, a better wife, a better doctor, I think a better and more patient, uh, appreciative human being. Like I value every moment on planet earth. I'm so grateful that I am 53 years old and every day I can get up and walk. And every day I can run, every day I can enjoy my children, my, my family. Every day I can contribute to medical students or to the work that I'm doing now in building a better healthcare system and serving the public in some way. The fact that the Burger King that we talked about is no longer, and maybe I had something to do with that. To me, that's exciting. Anything I can do to serve this movement, to bring awareness. And now not everybody wants to hear the message. Not anybody, not everybody wants to change. And that's fine. And I respect that but I want people to be at least informed, right? And if I can do that, then I've done what I think is my purpose. Incredible story. And um, we would love to celebrate for a minute your achievement with Burger King. Um, Dr. Stantik has been fighting uh, this fight against Burger King for many, many years to get Burger King out of the hospital. And yes, everybody has the right to eat Burger King, but we shouldn't be promoting it in our hospitals uh, because after all, hospitals are there for healing purposes. And finally, Dr. Stantik just heard that she won the fight and they are going to release Burger King from the contract and they won't see the back of it uh, in, in her hospital. So congratulations for that. Amazing oh, okay. achievement. I, 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 I congratulated the, the current CEO at University Hospital because he finally had uh, the courage to, to um, end the contract and I'm grateful for that. But I, I always thought uh, over the many years, it's been there for 25 years, that this the presence of this fast food restaurant within the hospital setting was incongruent with the healthcare um, environment. I just don't understand it. And I, I have been criticized because um, there are people who may want to eat Burger King. And again, uh, by the way, I, I come from, I was born in Cuba, a communist country. So I'm all about freedom and, and choice. But my concern is not that it's across the street or 
is that it's within the hospital. So that w w w if it's sitting within the four walls of the healthcare setting, then what we're saying to the patient or the community is that this food is reasonable for you to consume. Mm. It's not, it's not. These foods promote chronic disease. These foods lead to diabetes. These foods lead to obesity. And we should not, as healthcare professionals, uh, allow that to be present within our hospital or healthcare settings. It's, it's as if it is no different than smoking. Right? Do you know when I was a medical student in, in the early, in the late eighties, you could smoke in the hospital? You could. It wasn't until 1993, at least here in the United States, that smoking was removed from all healthcare settings. In 19, and it took a long time to get that done because in 1964, the Surgeon General produced a report, the very first one, that illustrated why smoking was detrimental to health. It, 10,000 studies illustrating why it was leading to heart disease and, and lung cancer and COPD. But yet in hospitals, we you can still smoke. And it took 30 years to get the cigarettes out of the hospital. Now, no one would say today that smoking, if somebody said, if somebody lit a cigarette in a hospital, people would lose their minds, right? I mean, I, my medical students, I say to them, do you know when I was in medical school, you could smoke and they don't believe me. They're like, doctors, there's no way. That's crazy. My mentor, she told me they used to smoke on rounds. Doctors, can you imagine rounding through the hospital with smoking? But with, the good news is that with each generation, we do better because we, we know better, right? And so I say to my students, when you're an attending physician and you're talking to your medical students 20 years from now, you're going to say to them, there used to be a Burger King in this hospital, and they're not going to believe you. They're not going to believe you. So keep that picture on your phone so you can show them. But, but every, the good news is that we're, we're learning and we're doing better. Um, but yes, it took a long time to get it out. Uh, we had a protest. We collected signatures on a petition. I think I've wrote just about everyone I could possibly write hundreds of emails over years asking them to please reconsider the presence of this. And, and honestly, when I received notice, this it was a week ago today that I learned that the Burger King had been decided to be closed and I felt uh, just so happy. This movement started in 2014 that, sh that you were trying to get them well, out. Even before that, even before that, was just, there was a, you wow. know, it's been many years, I think more than uh, close to 15 years that I've been campaigning. And yeah, 20, I, I mentioned the 2014 because I wrote an article on LinkedIn called the, There's a Burger King in the Hospital, and it got a lot of attention. Um, and um, and that, that, uh, article that I wrote then sort of strengthened my resolve to continue on and 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 that led to the petition and the the letter writing campaign but but no responses and in fact the CEO, the prior uh, CEO uh, wouldn't respond to my email so I actually printed uh, the 3,000 signatures and the many comments and I went to the hospital with hoping knocking on the door to meet with him and I think he he might have escaped out through another. He just didn't want to talk to me. Didn't want to talk about it. But but you um, did it. You achieved it, and you well, really are a force of good in so many ways. Um, you have educated us from you know America. Your message has reached us, and hopefully it will reach so many more people. It's a movement that you have started in your own right. So we'd love to congratulate you and celebrate that for a minute because it's so many many years. You know of thinking that you're talking to the wall, but as you said, um, actually somebody is always listening. Yes, that we made that comment earlier today. Yeah, sometimes you feel like no one is listening, but keep at it, somebody is. And when you let, least expect it, things will turn in the right. I mean, if you're on the right path and you're doing the right thing uh, and you're doing, you're taking action for the right reasons, ultimately uh, have faith that, uh, you'll see some light at the end of that seemingly dark tunnel. Beautiful, incredibly inspiring, as you said, self-care is healthcare. And yeah. as we come to the hour, before we move on to the more intimate non-recorded part of afternoon tea, this is like the informal consultation part of afternoon tea, which is 
um, where our guests can speak to us and speak to Dr. Sansik with uh, a little bit more comfort without the re recording and ask questions. Could we ask you, um, what are the three actionable and practical takeaways and that our guests can um, implement right away to take control of their health? Yeah, well, I would say the first thing um, regarding your diet, what could you do to add a piece of fruit or a, a, a veggie or something onto your plate? Uh, consider doing that, starting as small as that, or even um, when you look down at your plate, what, if the animal source is taking up half of your plate, consider making that just a little smaller, a quarter of your plate, and, and fill that plate with colorful veg vegetables. I think that's an important small step that any one of us can take in the right direction. Physical activity, there are guidelines that we should be, uh, in the United States, the physical activity guidelines tell us that we should engage in 150 minutes of cardiovascular activity per week. Forget the guidelines, just go out there and see if you're sedentary right now, you don't have to go out and you know run or walk for a mile. Just go out and walk five minutes. Just strap on those sneakers and go out and get moving. And then whatever you do, whatever you can do, be consistent. Don't just do it for a week or two and then, oh, nothing's happening. The scale hasn't moved, don't give up. Every single day, go out there and get some movement into your life. I promise you that in over the long haul, it's going to pay off great dividends. And then I, I would add that we talked a lot about sleep with Erica. I think sleep is so important. If you're not getting those eight hours of restful sleep, uh, then think about why that is. Um, are you having a couple of glasses of wine before you go to bed and understand how that affects it? Think about what you need to do in your environment to assure that the environment improves, that your actions are aligned with assuring that you're getting those eight hours because those eight hours of sleep are so important. And when you engage in those um, behaviors, I think you're going to feel so much better. Amazing, such a, such incredible three points that are actionable, easy to implement and really going to make a huge difference. I mean, we can see the story, your story. Um, I mean, you could have had so many excuses, but you didn't. And you took it on and you changed your lifestyle from busy position uh, and showed us that it's possible. So incredible and so actionable. Thank you so much. Um, next Sunday, uh, we have Dr. Ka um, Karen Adamson join us uh, to talk about thyroid disorder. And um, do you stay with us for the next uh, few 15 minutes if you are right to stay with us, Dr. San Santik, um, just to answer a few questions privately. Um, so you can connect with us on Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel where this talk will be uploaded. And you can become a free uh, ATW member to continue this conversation on the platform. If you have any questions later on, or you would like to ask us more in private, we can uh, support you there through the community, helping you to implement the healthful lifestyle changes you want um, that will help you to fulfill the life that you want to live. Uh, thank you very much for all the listeners who joined us a live stream. And now we are going to stop recording and we are going to answer any of your questions on Zoom. Um, thank you, Dr. Svantec, uh, for this incredible talk.